Hello, everybody. So we're going to do a quick Hyperledger Fabric update uh, instead of a actual demo. We didn't think we could do an actual demo in five minutes. So we're going to give a couple updates on what's been going on in the past year since the last global forum. Arnold's going to kick it off and talk about the new samples and tutorials. Yes, hi, everyone. So welcome. Um, so we actually went through quite a bit of uh, revamping of the tutorials and samples. If you haven't uh, seen this before, or even if you haven't looked at it recently, you'll see quite a bit of a change. Um, there was, uh, in terms of the tutorials, we have a really complete set now that go from the very beginning on how to get started. And you know, quite frankly, you can get a test network running in literally like three commands or so. Uh, of course, there are some prerequisites such as having Docker install, curl, and things like this, but pretty standard stuff. And then when it comes to the samples, we had a, we had a really thorough uh, pass through all the samples. Initially, the samples are kind of grown organically, and we had like a bunch of disparate stamp samples. And uh, a lot of them actually came, you know, were historical. They, they initially came from like some tests and things like this. We actually took a very deliberate approach and trying to have a very progressive uh, uh, road towards, you know, taking you through all the different features in Hyperledger Fabric, starting with the very basic examples of asset transfer and then going to a lot of different uh, aspects such as, you know, private data and so on. So I think with the, what we have now, you should be able to actually take this as a starting point for your application. You should be able to find something that's close enough to get started. And other things we did as part of this effort was to make sure that the samples were actually a good basis for something that could eventually be in production. Initially, there were things we were taking a lot of shortcuts and, and not necessarily showing best practices. So the samples were rewritten with in mind best practice to get people on the right start so that they wouldn't you know, open holes, security holes, and so on. So with this, Dave, keep them going. OK, sure. So I'll give a quick update on what we've been doing in the project the past year in addition to the samples and tutorials. Um, we released a Fabric 2.2 in July of 2020 last year. This is actually the long-term support release that most production customers are on currently. Uh, most, most users are moving uh, up from 1.4 to 2.2 these days. And 2.2 provides a lot of good things. First and foremost, the decentralized governance for smart contracts. This, this allows you to set up policies for which organizations need to agree on a smart contract deployment or update. And you can use those same types of patterns in your own chain codes, your own smart contracts uh, for setting up you know, agreements uh, and approvals and that type of thing using some of those same patterns in your own use cases. Uh, there's also private data enhancements in 2x. Uh, for example, you can share and verify private data on a need-to-know basis. There are collection-level endorsement policies that lets you restrict uh, which organizations write to a certain private data collection in, in addition to the chain code level endorsement policies that you might know. Uh, and there's also new support for external chain code launcher uh, so that you can uh, build and run chain code in the technology of your choice. You don't have to use Docker. This eliminates the Docker and Docker requirements that a lot of people do not like. So that's the long-term support release that's out there now. Uh, more recently, uh, we've been doing some other releases. Uh, 2.3 came out in November 2020. Uh, it has two major things in it. You can manage an ordering service without a system <clears throat> channel. So this allows more decentralized nature of the ordering service. Uh, you can now join um, ordering nodes to a channel similar to how you've always joined peer nodes to a channel. Uh, it has improved privacy, scalability, administration, and so on. And then ledger snapshots uh, allow you to take a snapshot of a channel, uh, including all the state of that channel. And you can join new peers from that snapshot. So this is going to be much quicker than, for example, joining a new peer from the Genesis block. So it doesn't have to process you know, millions of blocks that came before. And you don't have to store those millions of blocks that came before either if you don't want to. And you can also use the snapshots to ensure peers have a consistent uh, state you know, within an organization or across organizations. And you can come to agreement on the snapshots uh, and state and essentially use that as a checkpoint uh, for your consortium. 
And then more recently in Fabric 2.4, this is the release we're currently working on. We put out an alpha of this in April of this year, uh, and we'll be you know, taking this to a real release later this year. But basically this, this release has the new Fabric Gateway component in it. The Fabric Gateway runs in the peer, and it basically does all the heavy lifting that the client SDKs used to do in terms of um, getting endorsements for you, for your application, and submitting a transaction to the ordering service. So it's a very similar uh, programming model to what you might have known previously with the submit transaction function call, for example, that did all of this for you under the covers, except that logic has now moved from the SDK side to the peer side, and it makes the SDKs uh, this much more lightweight and consistent across the different language SDKs. So this will be coming with a new set of lightweight SDKs for uh, Go and for Java and for Node. Uh, I think at this point, though, we'll open it up to any uh, questions that people might have about Fabric. So this is an ask me anything style, so go ahead and ask anything. So hold on. So there was a question. Uh, would we share the slides? Um, so I actually yes. think everything is shared in the end, but uh, we can also provide a link. Let me grab the link. You added I think I can day. attach them today and people can but see them I as put of today. In the chat so that if people want to look into the chat tab, you'll find the link to the documentation and all the tutorials uh, you know, can be found there. And uh, from there, you'll be able to find the repos and how to get started downloading all the images and finding the samples, etc. So, Q and A. Hold on, we have more questions coming in. So, can you share? Can you please share more insights of including the gateway in the peer? What it means that it will work. Implications. So, people may be familiar with the gateway actually, right? Because this is a concept that was brought into the SDK to provide a higher level API than was initially available uh, in, the, in the original SDK. And, um, and now we are moving it into the peer, which I honestly find that interesting in the sense that it kind of gets us back to the original model we had with the Fabric uh, you know, uh, 06 version, where the peer actually provides a much higher level API for the client. There are actually some advantages to this, the fact that you know, the SDKs can share a lot of the code that's now in, that's actually in common, where they do a lot of the same operations. Today, we add different SDKs. There's a lot of, you know, uh, technical depth involved in maintaining all these different SDKs in different languages that essentially do a lot of the same thing. And here, we can have a much thinner SDK, which makes the application lighter. And there are some operations can be actually optimized in the peer because before it would require several round trips between the client and the peer. And now this can be done locally. So there are actually better performances as well. And from a maintenance point of view or, or network uh, management, you only need a network uh, connection between the client and the peer you happen to talk to, as opposed to in the, you know, without the gateway in the peer, uh, you would have to connect to multiple uh, nodes to get all the endorsements, collect the endorsements, and then connect to the ordering service. So it also makes the maintenance much easier. But Dave, do you want to add something? I think that was a good summary. You want to see if there's other questions there? Oh yeah, there's plenty of questions. So we're not going to be out of here soon. Uh, any, major, any major changes planned for future versions? I'll let you take that one. Uh, so no major changes, as you can see with some of the features that we've been adding. They're more additive, um, so no fundamental changes to the architecture or programming model, that type of thing. Some of the things we are looking at next is other private data enhancements to make it more suitable for GDPR type scenarios. Uh, we're going to do, uh, like I mentioned, the, the pure snapshot. Uh, for the channels, we're going to take that to the next step, which would be uh, ability to archive old blocks, that type of thing. 
So we're just adding uh, bells and whistles to make operating fabric easier, but not really changing the base architecture. So the base architecture uh, is pretty mature um, and we're, we're pretty happy with it. So no major changes in, in that area. No, and I think, you know, looking beyond, so with the snapshot, we'll be able to do, you know, uh, pruning. That's something that's, uh, you know, we're talking about, but there is other, other things like, uh, uh, we are talking about, I just lost my thought, sorry. I'm also checking the Q&A at the same time. That's um, Never mind, I'll get back to it later if I remember. So there is a next question, which is private data collections. Do you know of what is the practical maximum number of private data collections in the production network? Um, right, so there's, in theory, no bounds on that. Uh, the private data collections end up being stored in the, the database, either LevelDB or CouchDB, and they're pretty lightweight structures. So there's not a real limitation there, but I would say it's more of a um, limitation in terms of how you manage your private data collections. So that can be a little bit difficult. So as you add private data collections, uh, kind of what I would call the old static private, statically defined private data collections, um, you'd have to define those for each set of organizations that want a private data collection. And that can be a maintenance um, hassle rather than a, you know, an architectural hassle or problem. Uh, and so one thing we take, we ask people to take a look at is the new implicit collections that came out in Fabric version two. Uh, the implicit collections are basically, uh, there's, there's a pre-existing collection per organization. And so each organization has a place to store their own private data. And if you want to store a piece of private data between two organizations, you can basically just store it in each of their implicit collections. Uh, this also allows the patterns I talked about in terms of like sharing private data. You, can, you might have a piece of private data that you've got. Uh, you can then share that with another organization on a need to know basis. And basically it would, it would get saved in, the, in their implicit private data collection. So that's a way to get around some of these hassles around maintenance of the private data collections. So while you were talking, I remember the other piece I wanted to mention was mere BFT. So, you know, a lot of people want to have BFT support in Fabric. So there was actually a recent contribution by IBM called mere BFT. It's in the form of a Hyperledger lab today, but um, it's actually usable, you know, in the form of a library that's uh, meant to be usable by other uh, networks as well. But so the plan is that eventually we will have a support for this in Fabric. And that's, you know, we don't have a, a firm uh, roadmap for this or time frame, but uh, that's the kind of things you can expect uh, moving forward. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one yeah. of the things incubated. I just thought I'd share yeah. this slide and we won't necessarily talk to it unless people have questions, but these are some of the things we're incubating in the, in the Hyperledger labs. So there was a question about uh, administrative capabilities uh, in, the, in the Node SDK. When are they going to come back? I have to admit, I don't know that. So administrative capabilities, things like uh, deploying a chain code and Creating I think maybe channel, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. Right. So those were intentionally moved out of the SDK so that the, so that the SDK could focus on applications. It's a very different role uh, doing this administration versus a regular uh, application that just interacts with, with Fabric. And so we don't see those coming back into the SDK what I would call the SDK proper. Uh, there might be uh, other SDKs that do those types of things. Um, but for now, you know, we have the CLI tools to do some of those types of utility things. We also have a, uh, in Go, if you're using Go, uh, we have a config library that lets you create applications. Uh, basically, you can create your own SDK for doing this, these types of things. All right, we're officially out of time, but, uh, you know, I invite everybody to follow up and uh, join the mailing list. We have a very active Fabric mailing list where you're welcome to join and contribute and ask questions. And we also have uh, several Rocket Chat channels. Uh, it's chat.iperledger.org where you can ask questions. So sorry for those who asked questions we didn't get to. But thank all right. you all for joining today. Thank you, Dave, for waking up in the middle of the night. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.